We went to the life support trailer where all the flying gear was for my squadron. All, we had, all 24 airplanes in my squadron were flying, so 24 of my guys were going. I was lucky enough to be the mission commander for this first one. Now, anybody who's been in a fighter squadron or any kind of flying squadron knows that in the life support, as you're getting ready to go, this is a pretty raucous place. You're giving people grief. You're arguing about who's better or whatever. Something's going on all the time. It's fun. This morning, there wasn't a sound. Not a whisper. That's Colonel Andy Perona right there on the right. You saw for class of 73. Got next one, Major J.D. Collins. You saw for class of 75. I got dressed listening to nothing but the whisper of zippers as people pulled on flight gear. I walked out of the trailer, down to the bottom of the steps, left the door open as the light from the inside shined out just in a little pool outside these steps off the trailer because the rest of the base was blacked out and we were under the camouflage netting. You couldn't see anything outside this trailer. And as my guys came down the steps, I shook each one of them's hand and I just nodded at them. Nobody said anything. And then I watched as one by one they turned and disappeared into the black. As each one left, I wondered if he'd be coming back that afternoon, because we didn't know. And then when the last one had gone, Master Sergeant Ray Uris, who ran my life support shop and had been standing in the doorway watching this, walked to the bottom of the steps, shook my hand, and watched me disappear. I'll never forget watching their backs disappear in the dark. Next slide, Fred. In the background is an airplane that was flown by my squadron weapons officer. His first name is Scott. I won't give you his last. He's Yusafa 78. About the second week of the war, we flew a mission against the nuclear power plant south of Baghdad. I believe Colonel Rackley over in XP may have been the mission commander for this. I don't remember. Colonel Rackley, by the way, is also Yusafa, class of 71, I think. Scott was a cell leader of 12 airplanes on this mission. And this mission was scary. Easily the scariest thing we saw in the war. Because the Iraqis defended the area south of Baghdad, and they really defended the nuclear power plant. From about 25 miles of the target until we got to the power plant, I bet I saw 100 SAMs in the air. And I remember screaming and cussing to myself all the way to the target until it came time to roll in and drop the bombs, at which point your training takes over and you kind of go quiet until you drop your bombs and you start screaming and cussing again. <laughs> this was scary. Scott's wingman got hit as we came off target. An SA-3 blew up, we don't know how close, but underneath his airplane, blew off his fuel tanks, put about 113 holes in the airplane, 73 of them through the engine bay and the engine compartment, which isn't good in a single engine F-16. And for the next two and a half hours, Scott escorted him as they tried to find an emergency base to land at because the weather had rolled in and they went to five different places and couldn't get him on the ground. And Scott worked emergency tanker diverts. He was having tankers come to them to get gas. He was phenomenal. He saved this guy's life. So he landed about three hours after the rest of us did. When I heard he was on the ground, I was in a debrief. I came out and I walked out to see how things had gone with his wingman. And it was dark by this time, and I walked out toward that life support trailer. I came around the corner under this darkened out camouflage netting, and I ran into something. And then realized it was Scott. And Scott was standing, leaning against a bunch of sandbags, just holding on to him, and shaking like a leaf. He couldn't walk. He couldn't talk. He couldn't move anything. All he could do is stand there and shake. The guy had nothing left. All his adrenaline was gone. He had done everything he had that he could do that day. And as I'm trying to figure out what the heck do I do with Scott, the door of this life support trailer opens and a young life support technician named Sean, who's a farm kid from Minnesota, 19 years old, walks out, looks at what's going on, walks down and says, boss, I know you got stuff to do. I'll take care of him. And I said, well, let me help you get him inside. And he says, boss, you got stuff to do. I'll take care of it. So I left. And I saw Sean helping Scott up the steps in the life support trailer as I went around the corner. About five hours later, about two in the morning, I left the mission planning cell, and I went to see how Scott was doing back in his, t in his tent. 
And when I got up to the tent, I kind of came around the corner. This is January in the desert, folks. It's cold outside. There's Sean, sitting in the sand in front of the tent, shaking like a leaf, because he's still wearing BDU pants and the T-shirt he had on life support. And he's got a pistol in his hand. Now, this was in the first week of the war. We were worried about terrorist threats and, you know, guys coming and helping out the Iraqi cause. And Sean had taken that to heart. And I said, Sean, what are you doing here? He said, sir, I, I was afraid the major would wake up. He finally got to sleep. If he wakes up, I want to make sure I let him know everything's okay. You'll meet lots of Sean's in the Air Force. And I'll never forget this one. Next slide, please. This is a Catholic priest, Father Pat. This is Father John Pearson. Father John was our squadron chaplain. The first day of Desert Storm, 